So today we have a very special person with us as the fifth BNSS Arishanda lecturer, and that is Dr. Jonathan Waters. He is going to speak on the topic bloodless care with compassion in obstetric and physiology. But first, uh, a little about him. Um, we had to cut everything down so that he would have enough time to talk. Uh, but, but we need to know that he's a professor in the departments of anesthesiology and bioengineering at the University of Pittsburgh. He is the chief of the division of anesthesiology at Madhu Women's Hospital of the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. And he's a member of the Magowan Institute for Regenerative Medicine. So Dr. Waters is the medical director of the patient blood management uh, program of the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center and the medical director of the blood management division of Proseca Incorporated, which is a UPSC owned biomedical engineering company. His area of expertise primarily focuses on transfusion management and blood salvage and obstetrics. He has received a lot of federally funded support to investigate these areas with over 150 peer reviewed publications, five books on the topic of blood management and a book on neurologic disease in pregnancy. Dr. Waters has served on the editorial board of the journal Transfusion, which you know is a very reputable uh, journal on the subject. And he's currently serving as the associate editor of that journal. He's the past president of the Society for the Advancement of Patient Blood Management, SABM. And he served on the board of directors of AABB between 2011 and 2015. He also chaired the Blood Management Technical Advisory Panel for the Joint Commission from 2007 to 2016. And so I present to uh, you, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Jonathan Waters, our fifth BMSS Arishanda lecturer. Dr. Waters. Thank you, Nathaniel, for uh, that nice introduction. And uh, thank you for inviting me to uh, speak here. Can you hear me OK? Yes, very well. I'm going to share my slides. Hopefully, you can all see that. There we go. Is the slide coming through? Yes, it has. OK, wonderful. I um, just want to say that I had taken the day off to attend this uh, conference today, but uh, because of staffing shortages, which seem to be something that's pervasive across the United States. Uh, I was called into the operating room to do cases. So if I get interrupted during the course of my presentation, I apologize in advance. Um, you can think of my stethoscope as my tie, um, which I would ordinarily be wearing. Um, at any rate, um, it is very difficult to follow Dr. Shander, um, the godfather of bloodless medicine. Um, he is uh, kind of uh, a god in the circles of bloodless care. Um, so it, it is a great honor to be giving this presentation, um, the R.A. Shander um, um, lecture. At any rate, um, I was asked to speak on compassion and obstetric anesthesiology, and I struggled with this title. Um, con con compassion is something that we don't think of. Um, I think it's something that comes innately for some of us and not so innately in others. Um, but uh, anyway, Nathaniel already um, took a couple of my first slides. Um, these are some of my disclosures. Um, I do some work with Hemonetics, which is one of the cell salvage companies. Levanova is a competitor. Vitalant is a company um, that provides blood to 19 states in the United States. Um, and I'm also the medical director of Biotronics, um, which is our uh, bioengineering um, company for the University of Pittsburgh. Um, so I started off, you know, looking at 
what exactly the meaning of compassion is. And this is what I found um, on Wikipedia, um, is that it means, you know, that you have a deep understanding of another person's pain and burden accompanied by a willingness to relieve them. And there's been a term that's, that's sprouted out of this compassion. It's called compassionate care, um, which has been determined to lead to higher satisfactions for patients um, happiness during the course of their, their healthcare experience. Um, these are all things that at least I value greatly. And I'd like to think that I'm a compassionate um, um, leader and healthcare provider. However, it's not so easy. Um, and I, a number of years ago, I ran across uh, an individual, Paul Ulick, um, who is uh, a cardiac surgeon at the University of Kansas. And he had teamed up with uh, a social psychologist, um, Ellen Rabowin, um, who is a, a, social, a social, sociologist at, the, at Stanford University. And they put together this book on um, implementation of collaborative practice. Um, at least for me, that's been kind of uh, um, earth shaking in terms of how we go about organizing our healthcare entities, you know, so that we do provide compassionate care. And what Ellen and Paul, uh, their key concept is that we need to recognize um, social circles, is that we're all very um, social animals. Um, and that we need to nurture the, the social environment that we practice within, and which in turn leads to happiness um, on the part of the healthcare providers, which gets translated to the patients. And so this concept of collaborative care um, is highlighted here, but it's basically you know, based on sharing communication so that everybody is on the same page. Um, and in my organization, we had a problem, at least in labor and delivery, um, with getting our first case started, our on-time um, start um, was about 8% of the time where we would start our OR cases um, on time, um, 8%. Um, it's horrible. Um, it was a dissatisfier to all the providers that made them very jaded, you know, as to the system and its dysfunction. It made our patients unhappy. Um, so we started a huddle um, based on um, the concepts that Ellen and Paul uh, propagated in their collaborative care book. Um, which, by the way, is available um, if you do a Google search on their names. Um, it will come up as a, a book that you can purchase, and I would highly recommend it. It, it. It's really kind of a novel way of approaching healthcare organization, um, believe it or not, where we focus on the fact that people, taking care of people are people. Um, so what we did is we started a morning huddle uh, before our operating room day started, and we invited everybody that participated in the care of our, our patients. Um, and this is a picture of one of our huddles, and you can see a lot of smiles, because um, that's what it generated, um, is that this camaraderie that came from meeting together before the start of the OR day um, was something that everybody felt um, was valuable. And we went from an 8% on time start um, to 100% on time start within a matter of about three weeks, um, just from getting together as a team and discussing all of the problems that each of us would be facing that particular day. Um, and that's, I think, kind of at the heart of, of providing compassionate care um, is being happy ourselves. Um, the part that we neglected really was the patient. Um, and I think a patient you know, is, a, is a key component to collaborative care and compassionate care. Um, 
you know, as we go about caring for these people that are sick, and it's a particularly trying time, um, with the idea being that all the providers, the family members, and the patient all gather at one point in the course of the day, and we get together and share, um, first of all, the patient's perspective on how things, how things are going, the family's perspective, um, and then what the healthcare team is planning to do for that patient. Um, and this eliminates a lot of misinformation and miscommunication as if everybody um, is collaborating together um, with a, the single focus of being the patient. And I think that's truly um, what composes compassionate care is focusing on what's valuable um, to that particular patient. So with the, the bloodless patient, um, you know, it, it, it's something that is um, unique to this particular patient population, but I think it's important, you know, to get together with that patient and discuss what's important to them. Um, and as we all know, um, being transfused is something that they don't want. Um, so we need to have a, a structure and foundation as to how we go about um, taking care of these patients. And I just have some data here, um, you know, regarding the, the size of the Jehovah's Witness population. And I just want to point out um, that in this um, latest um, decade, we have a, a new population of bloodless patients. Um, they are patients that will agree to a transfusion, um, but they don't want um, blood from patients who have been vaccinated um, with COVID. Um, so while they'll accept a blood transfusion, it, it's about 25% of our patient population now um, that uh, request a, a bloodless, bloodless care. So this is really important um, for me and my practice um, because the Jehovah's Witness Church was founded in Pittsburgh um, back in 1872, I believe, this is a plaque uh, more memorializing uh, the foundation of the church here. It happens to be next to our football stadium, which is another place that we pray um, every week, um, uh, more lately than um, in, in the past, because our football team kind of stinks. Um, but at any rate, um, these are the, the tenets by which um, the Jehovah's Witnesses base their beliefs um, I'm sure I'm speaking to the choir here. At any rate, um, one of the first things that we recognized um, when we built our program um, was we needed to have a mechanism for identifying um, our bloodless patients um, when they came into our hospital. And we had a couple of lawsuits that were filed because we didn't recognize Jehovah's Witnesses and we didn't treat them the way they wanted to be treated. Um, so now um, what we have is a, um, a, a series of questions that are um, placed or made to the patient as they're being admitted to our hospital. And one of these is in the middle of this slide um, as to whether or not a blood transfusion would be acceptable. Um, and we basically had to wordsmith um, the language on this um, for quite a while and quite a few permutations it, it took because nobody wants to be transfused if they can help it. Um, you know, so we would get uh, a no responses uh, frequently um, and it was overwhelming um, to differentiate who was truly um, willing to um, avoid a blood transfusion if it, if it was deemed necessary. Um, versus who, who would just prefer not to be transfused. So I think we all share that um, general perception is that, you know, we want to avoid transfusion if we can help, if we can do so. There's also a question um, on our nurse, nursing admission sheet, as is shown here, about whether or not um, the patient would like for an advocate um, from our bloodless medicine program to speak with them. And, um, you know, this is the result. Um, 
So we also had another mechanism that we developed within our um, computerized uh, information systems where a physician could order a consult from our bloodless medicine program um, if a patient is achieving um, what we would consider dangerous levels of anemia um, and they have this bloodless desire. So it's important um, that every patient uh, be educated, you know, as to what um, blood products are available. And I think for most patients, the, the, the red cells, the white cells, the platelets um, and plasma are considered, you know, absolute um, not um, products that they would accept. But uh, some of these conscious matters or the fractions um, require a conversation, first of all, um, to explain to the patient what they are um, and um, you know, whether or not they're manufactured and how they're manufactured, um, because everybody has different perspectives on whether or not these are okay. Um, so we have two bloodless medicine advocates. This is the leader um, shown here, Debbie Tatro, um, who is the kind of the spearhead of our bloodless medicine program. And she talks to pretty much every you know, bloodless patient that's identified on our um, nursing admission form um, to distinguish you know, what their requirements are, what their needs are, so that the rest of us you know, caring for these patients are able to um, meet their, their wishes. Um, this has um, led to 411 inpatient consults back in 2018. Um, most recently, we're up to about 1,500 um, consults uh, per year um, for our bloodless medicine um, program. And what Debbie does is she goes through a list um, of the kinds of things um, that meet these um, criteria of being conscious matters, you know, of what patients might accept and what they might not. And this is a, a sample of the checklist that we give to our patients um, that they can carry around with them in their wallet um, so that when they come into the hospital, they can hand this to their providers um, so that everybody is on the same page um, so that we can provide the care that the patient wishes. We also put a note into our medical record um, and an example of this note is shown here um, so that everybody taking care of this patient um, knows um, what the patient's wishes um, might be. We've also got a, a fairly um, detailed um, list of online materials that are available for um, the clinician. Um, this is shown here, and um, we have an advocacy service, um, which I just described. Um, we have a consultation service, which I'm the primary consultant, uh, along with Daryl Traulzi, who's our um, medical director of our blood bank. Um, he and I provide medical consultation um, to our clinicians caring for these patients if they so need it. Um, and these are some of the, the resources that we have available. And we have something called uh, HBOC 201, which is Hemapur, which is an artificial blood, um, which we can provide to our patients. This is a non-FDA approved um, product, um, but it can be life-saving in some circumstances. Now I've come to become very reliant on our hospital liaison committee. Um, this is um, some information about our hospital liaison committee. Um, whenever we have a patient that doesn't trust us, um, we involve uh, the liaison that's assigned to our hospital um, so that we can uh, bring in um, somebody to consult with the patient um, and explain from a layman's perspective you know, how we are going to care for that patient. I think that's been hugely important um, in our ability to respect the patient's wishes and to provide the compassionate care. This is just latest data for the last quarter. 
Um, and we've got this program um, across all of our hospitals. And I think we have uh, 58 hospitals within the UPMC system um, that provide um, some degree of bloodless medicine um, for our patients. And then we've been rolling out uh, um, some um, new uh, projects as is illustrated here. So my slide or my um, slide set was supposed to be about bloodless obstetrical care. Um, so what can we do in the obstetrical um, environment? Um, and what we see here in the United States, at least, and I think this is true of the world, um, is there's an increasing maternal mortality rate. Um, and this is some data as to the causes of death. Um, this comes from the CDC, the Center for Disease Control in the United States, um, across all states in the United States, all 50 states. And you can see hemorrhages is number four in the causes of death. But I think what's more important to look at is basically coagulation dysfunction as a category in and of itself, um, because women die not only from hemorrhage, but they also die of too much clotting um, and leads to DVTs and, um, and pulmonary emboli. So this is a spectrum in my mind of, of dysfunction um, that is the leading cause of death in the United States during childbirth. If you look at or drill down um, into individual states, um, the leading causes of death um, change. I mean, in this report, uh, we found that uh, hemorrhage was the leading cause of death. And in the state of California, um, maternal mortality rates um, are extraordinary. Um, it's around 200 maternal deaths for every 100,000 patients, which if you think of it in a different way, it's one maternal death for every 5,000 um, patients. Um, so, um, and if you look at this data from California, obstetrical hemorrhage um, has the greatest chance of preventing that death. Um, so um, what can we do? Um, and in the Jehovah's Witness patient, I try to think about what I can do to offer alternatives um, to blood products, um, the primary blood components. Um, and these are some of the things that we can offer to our patients um, that get around um, or are able to avoid um, the whole blood components. An autotransfusion, as many of you probably know, is kind of my passion. Um, autotransfusion, or other not, otherwise known as uh, cell salvage, um, has been basically adopted and advocated by these organizations. It was first pioneered in 1874 by this physician, William Highmore, um, who at the end of this um, article in The Lancet, uh, uh, said this is basically the, the way we prevent um, hemorrhagic death as we collect blood um, from the bleeding patient and we retransfuse it. And I think in many parts of the third world, this is still the case and how we should approach these patients is just collect the blood and put it back in them. Um, in the United States, we have these fancy machines um, where we can... Um, wash, um, filter, and reperfuse patients um, with the blood that they've shed. In this particular device, the leukocyte depletion filter um, alleviates a lot of the fear that many uh, clinicians have with this autotransfusion process, and that this filter will remove a lot of things that we're afraid of. Now, we have expanded our autotransfusion program um, to uh, using it in vaginal um, deliveries, which is 70% of all deliveries um, in American hospitals. Um, and it's a rich opportunity um, for giving blood back. And this was a report that came out of England um, where they looked at bacterial contamination, which is the fear of, of most people in doing this um, or doing autotransfusion in vaginal delivery. I mean, you can see there is some bacterial contamination based on this investigator's work. 
Um, and it's of these bacteria. The thing is, is that these patients are already exposed to these bacteria. Um, so we looked at um, uh, a case series in our in our hospital of 64 you know, patients that had vaginally contaminated blood um, reinfused. And we found that the outcomes um, were equivalent um, as is shown in this slide. We published this in Blood Transfusion, which is the Italian journal um, of blood management or rather of transfusion medicine, um, where we found no outcome differences um, in our patients that were transfused with their own vaginally collected blood. How we do it, we use a double um, collection system where we collect the amniotic fluid um, and discard that amniotic fluid, and then we collect all the rest of the blood. And then we use this device in all of our labor rooms where we can collect blood inexpensively um, and uh, give it back to the patients. So other things that we can do for our OB patient population is we can focus on anemia. Um, this is a problem that pretty much um, uh, assigns patients to whether or not they'll need to be transfused or not. Um, if they come in with a hemoglobin of six and a half, um, odds are you know, that the, the blood loss tolerated or um, occurring during delivery will put them at risk of needing a transfusion. So, and it's a really simple thing um, to fix. Um, the cost is cheap. Even if we go for intravenous um, drugs or iron supplements, uh, such as shown here in American hospitals, um, a fair less at dose um, is about $9, which is super inexpensive. So I've, I've gotten our obstetricians to be doing this uh, much more frequently so that we don't have patients coming to us anemic and iron deficient. There's probably not much role for erythropoietin in pregnancy, um, just because normal erythropoietin levels um, during pregnancy go up. Um, so supplementing it, unless the patient has renal insufficiency where they're not able to increase their um, erythropoietin concentrations, it's probably a waste of time. Some of the plasma substitutes, um, these are pharmaceuticals basically that we can use in the bleeding patient, I think is something that I've come to recognize as being really important. Um, and we have Rheostap, um, which is a fibrinogen concentrate. Um, and it's a pharmaceutical that most of our um, bloodless patients will accept because it's been manufactured. We also have other products, Case Centra, which is a four-factor PCC. Um, it might be mislabeled as a four-factor PCC. It's actually six factors um, that you can give, uh, again, something that's manufactured um, and would be deemed a, a pharmaceutical. And then we have Octoplast, um, which is a pool plasma product um, that if it's explained to the patient that this is also manufactured, um, and is, um, at least in my mind, a pharmaceutical, um, this is oftentimes acceptable too. So I will leave you at this point um, with a picture that I'm quite fond of, um, that one of the, the daughters of one of the Jehovah's Witnesses that we took care of uh, drew for me. Um, her name's London, um, and her mother may be watching today. At any rate, um, I thought this was very special, you know, that she would take the time out and um, and draw this picture for me. And I will finish there. And thank you all for listening.